This is Data 8, lecture number 37 on conditional probability. First, I'd like to show you how we've updated the where method in the middle of the semester. I made these changes over spring break. Um, I wish I had made them at the beginning of the term, but I didn't think of them until now. So let's say you have a table. Here, this is just a bunch of the usual nonsense. Um, now we have a table. And this is the table you've seen before, the top grossing movies of all time in the United States. Um, and each one has a title and a year. Now, we've always been able to say t dot where year is a particular year. And that will give me all the movies that were top grossing. This is the 200 top grossing. They were released in 2015. But things became more complicated when we wanted to get a group of years, like all years later than 2013. It used to be the case that you had to say t dot column year greater than 2013, which worked fine. This gives me the 2015 and 2014 movies. But we had to repeat t both here and here, which if t was a longer name became frustrating. Now there's a new way. Instead of writing this, you can instead write t dot where, say what column you want to use for filtering, and then give an expression for how you want to filter that column. So I could say I want the numbers that are above 2013. That will give me the 2014s and 2015s. So in general, if you're trying to filter for particular rows in a table using where, and the values that you're using to compute the condition are all in one column, then you just write the label for that column, and then r, and there's a bunch of uh, different relations, above, below, above or equal to, etc. There's things like between, and between has the same behavior as a range, where it includes the first lower bound and excludes the top lower bound. So this gives all movies between 1980 and 1989, um, but not 1990. So these are the movies in the 80s. Today we'll talk about distributions. A distribution is related to the notion of probability. Now what is that? Well, first we need to define some terms. An experiment is some occurrence with an uncertain outcome, something that happens in the world. And the outcome is the result of an experiment, which is often a number or a category. The sample space is the set of all possible outcomes for the experiment, which is something you should know in advance. What could have happened? And the outcome is what did happen. An event is defined in terms of outcomes. It's a subset of the sample space of the possible outcomes. And the event is all of the different outcomes that together have some property of interest. What about probability? Well, that's the proportion of experiments for which the event occurs, meaning for which the outcome is one of the elements of the event. Now we can finally say what a distribution is. A distribution just describes the probability of all possible events. So those are all possible subsets of all the outcomes. For this course, we're just going to focus on a particular kind of distribution called a multinomial distribution. It's a distribution with a fixed number of possible outcomes. Another way to say this is that the sample space, or number of possible outcomes, is finite. All outcomes must be mutually exclusive for any experiment. One outcome happens and the rest don't. The sum of the chances of the outcomes is one, so one of the outcomes has to occur. The probability of an event for a multinomial distribution is the sum of the chances of the outcomes in which the event occurs. OK, so what I've said is that there's a bunch of different possible outcomes for the experiment, each of which has a chance associated with it. An event is some subset of those outcomes, and now we have a definition of a probability, the sum of the chances of the outcomes in which the event occurs. So here's an example. If I roll two dice, the experiment is rolling both dice just once. The outcome is the first die result and the second die result paired together. So the sample space in this case is 36 possible outcomes, what you got on your first die roll and what you got on your second die roll. An event, for example, 
would be that the two dice sum to five. So here are the possible different outcomes, one, two, three, four of them, each of which is a pair, that describes all the different ways that one can roll five in total if you're just summing together the two outcomes of the dice. So that's an event. It's a subset of the sample space. The probability of this event is four out of 36, or one out of nine, and that's something we could compute using our computer. So here's a quick snippet of code that defines two dice. Each row is an outcome that tells us what's the first die rolls and second die rolls number that comes up when you roll the dice. And the chance here is the chance of the outcome, the chance of these two things occurring together. Um, and each of these is different and distinct, and only one can occur and the rest don't occur. So you either roll a one and a four or you roll a one and a five, but you can't do both. Now, in order to represent the event that the sum of the dice is five, we'll first compute the dice sums. So that's the first roll plus the second roll. And those that equal five are just a handful of them. If we want to pick out the rows in the original table, where the dice sum is five. That would be one and four, two and three, three and two, four and one. So we'll call that sum of five. And if we want to know the probability that sum of five occurs, that's an event, we would sum up the chance column of this event table. And that's one ninth in decimal four. Okay, so let's review what we have so far. For a multinomial distribution, you represent it as a table which has one row per outcome and the chance of that outcome. An event for a multinomial distribution is some subset, anything where you've picked out some of the rows of the whole distribution table. And if you want to know the probability of that event, you just sum up the chance column. So next we'll define a function called p, which just computes the probability of any event that will return the sum of the events chance column. So now we can let's say, what's the probability of the event that the sum of the two dice that I roll is five, it's one nine. Now a distribution doesn't have to have just a constant value for every chance. There could be different chances. And we can construct such a distribution. So I'm gonna take two dice and I'm gonna add a column with a column called sum, which has the dice sums in it. And I'll call this with sums. Now this is still the original distribution. I've just annotated it with some extra information about each outcome. But if I take with sums and I group by the sum, I see that different sums occur with different frequency in this table. So if instead of grouping first, I just selected the sum column and the chance column, and then grouped by the sum of the dice and performed sum on the chance operation, what I end up with is a different multinomial distribution. This is describing the same kind of thing, but has a different set of outcomes. The outcomes are just the sum of the dice. I don't care what the original faces of the dice said. And what I see here in this column is the chance of each sum occurring. So here, an outcome in this distribution is that the sum of the dice is five, and that outcome has one ninth chance. Now we should clean this up a little bit, in particular by relabeling the column called chance sum, just chance. And then we can call this the two dice sums distribution. Okay, so now let's talk about an event that we could compute under either of the distributions. What's the chance that I roll um, more than nine? So um, in the with sums distribution, I'd say where some are above nine, I get a bunch of different events, and then I compute the probability of those, and it tells me that it's one sixth or 0 0.16666. 
Alternatively, if I take the two dice sums distribution, which only has sums and the chances of those sums, and I say where the sum are above 9, I'm getting fewer outcomes, but it happens to be that the same probability is represented. So the lesson I hope you learn is that tables are a good way of representing multinomial distributions. You just list out all the outcomes and the chance of each one. Then an event is a table where you've taken the original distribution and picked out some of the outcomes. So now you get a subset of outcomes, and if you sum up their chances, then you get the probability of that event. So now we're going to talk about a real data example, the time that babies are born in the United States. Babies are born in many ways. What do I mean by that? Well, some are born in the hospital, some are born at home, some are born in the car on the way to the hospital. Um, sometimes when they're born in the hospital, they're born through a surgery called a C-section. Sometimes they're not. Um, and even if they're not, sometimes you know, drugs are involved in order to make sure that things go faster or slower, depending on how the baby's doing and how the mom is doing. Now, it turns out that doctors and nurses are not naturally nocturnal people. They're regular people. And so they like to work during business hours. The Center for Disease Control in the United States has tried to record the time of birth for all babies born in the United States. And so we can look at what's the probability that a baby's born at a particular time. And we'll find some interesting facts. So what they've published recently is data available from 2013. It was only published just now because it takes a long time to collect information from lots of different states. And in fact, they missed a bunch of states. So they were only able to aggregate information about all births from 41 states and Washington, D.C. And that's over 90% of the people that were born. So we're just going to use those numbers in order to describe the probability of being born at particular times. Let's look at the data. I guess I should say now that I was looking for an example that would be really interesting. And since I just had a baby, birth times are interesting to me. Maybe they're not so interesting to you, but bear with me. Okay, so here's what was recorded. Is that for particular times of the day, which we can represent as a single integer on a 24-hour clock, um, or with its typical English description, we have the chance that a baby was born at that time, which is just the frequency in the United States among all those 90 states that recorded their information correctly, uh, that the proportion of babies that were born in that particular hour. So 7 a.m. goes all the way from 7 a.m. to 7.59 a.m. and 59 seconds. Okay, this is a multinomial distribution. We can compute the probability of events. So I could say birth dot where um, hour. are between, how about, 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. And I would call those business hours, the times when people normally work. And we'll see that this only includes 10 different rows, 10 different hours. So 10 out of 24 is, well, we can compute it, 10 out of 24, is just 41.7% of the day. Yet, the probability of a baby being born during business hours is 52.8%. So most babies are born during business hours, even though that's only 10 out of the 24 hours in the day. And that's because doctors like to work in the day. So you see a particularly high spike at 8 a.m. when the doctor shows up. You know, the baby's mom's probably been at the hospital all day, and um, now it's time to have a baby. Alternatively, we can see that birth dot where um, our are below 6. So this is like midnight to 6 a.m. Because 5 a.m. goes all the way up just until before 6 a.m. Um, the probability of being born in this quarter of the day is only 16.8%. Very unusual to be born at that time, even though it is a quarter of the day. Wardrobe change, conditional distributions. First, I'll define a conditional probability. 
That's the probability of an event B, given that an event A has occurred. So here we know information about the events. An out the outcome of an experiment. We know that it's one of the outcomes in the event A. We don't necessarily know which one. Then we compute the probability of event B, given the restricted set of possible outcomes remaining for the experiment. In this case, both events B and A have to describe the same experiment and the same sample space. In order to compute the conditional probability of B given A, we find all the outcomes in which A occurs. Those are the ones that are possible given an event A. Divide the chances of A's outcomes by the probability of A. That makes the chance of each remaining outcome sum to one. Then we find all the outcomes in which B also occurs and sum the updated chances of these outcomes. That will give us a probability that might be less than one. The conditional probability of B given A. This is typically written as probability of B given A is equal to the probability that both events A and B occurred. So that means only the outcomes in which A occurs and B occurs, divided by the probability of A. In this recipe, we first compute what's called the conditional distribution. That's a multinomial distribution That's a probability distribution represented as a table where the chances of the outcome sum to one. But it's a smaller set of outcomes that we had in the original sample space. It's the ones that are only the ones where A occurs. Okay, let's look at how um, we implement this using tables. We start with our business hours event. That's gonna be our event A. And what we'll ask for is what's the probability that a baby was born before noon, given that it was born during business hours. First, we have to build the conditional distribution given business hours. This is an event. The probability is not one, meaning the chances do not sum to one. They sum to 52.8%. If I take the original business hours table, which describes an event, and I replace its chances with the business hours chances, each divided by the total probability of business hours, I get a distribution. A distribution where the chances sum to one. It's a distribution only over the 10 outcomes where the event business hours occurs. That's event A. So what we've created here is given business hours, a conditional distribution. Now it is a distribution, which means the chances should sum to one, and they do. Now we can compute the conditional probability of any event conditioned on this event, business hours. So for instance, we could ask, What about only the hours that are before noon? That's a event conditioned on another event. Its probability is 40% about. What this means is that if we sample a birth time from the distribution that we set out originally, and we then learn the information that that time is within business hours. That's the given A part. Then the chance that that time is before noon is 40%. This is different than just saying, what's the probability that a birth is between 8 a.m. and noon? So that's like the before noon part of business hours. But that doesn't condition on anything at all. So if we computed that, that would be um, the morning is all the births where the hour are between 8 and noon, these chances do not sum to 40%. They sum to 
This one says, uh, what's the chance that a baby's born between 8 and noon? This says something different. Given that it was born during business hours, what's the chance that it was born between 8 and noon? According to the formula I showed you, there should be a way to compute the conditional probability of the morning given business hours using just the probability of the morning and the probability of business hours. And in fact, you can do that. So if I took just the straight probability of the baby being born between 8 and noon, so that is a joint event where both the baby is born during business hours and it's born before noon, and I divide it by the probability that the baby is born during business hours, then I do get the conditional probability that I had before. So I can compute it from the conditional distribution, or I can compute it from the original distribution just by taking a ratio of the probability of events A and B both occurring divided by the probability of event A. This transformation that we've made here is a general transformation. It's, we'll call it given. So given an event means we return a distribution where we start with that event, replace its chance columns with the same chances we had before divided by the probability of the event. So then we can say, uh, given business hours, and get the conditional distribution, we could then find um, the event before noon and compute its probability to get that same chance that a baby was born in the morning given that it was born during business hours. Here's a discussion question. Very similar problem. How would you complete the following expression to compute the probability that a baby is born before 6 p.m. given that it is born after noon? So afternoon is an event which includes all the hours that are above 11. What do I do? Well, I take afternoon. I convert it into a conditional distribution using the given function that I just wrote. I have to then specify the event. Baby is born before 6 p.m. So I'd write an expression like r dot below 18, which is the 24-hour representation of 6 p.m. And then what goes here? Well, that's the p function to compute the probability of that event conditioned on another event. So here we build the conditional distribution, we build the event, and then we're done. So just to watch it work, afternoon is the following event given afternoon looks like that. So all the chances have been scaled up. Before 6 p.m. is when I say hour r below 18. That's just an event for the conditional distribution, and its probability is 57.8%. A joint distribution has an outcome that describes two things happening at once. So a joint probability is defined according to joint events and joint outcomes. A joint event is the intersection of two events all outcomes in which both event A and event B both occur. So if I have this equation that I showed you before, and I just rearrange the terms, I see that the probability of two different events occurring together is the probability of that first event times the conditional probability of the second given the first. A joint distribution is the probability of all joint events, expressed as a table of joint outcomes and their chances. Let's do a quick demo of that. Here's another table from the CDC. It has the time and the hour, but then it has two different distributions. What's the probability that a baby is born at a particular hour on a weekday, and what about on a weekend? Both of these columns sum to one. They're not necessarily related to each other. They're describing different conditional distributions. They're both over the hour outcomes, but one conditions on the baby being born on a weekday, Monday through Friday, and the other one on Saturday and Sunday. Now here's a visualization of that table that was generated and published by the CDC. On the vertical axis is the percent of babies born at a particular hour, and here are all the hours. They start at 6 a.m., go around to 5 a.m., and the green line is Monday through Friday. 
This light blue line is Saturday and Sunday. And you can see the distributions are quite different. So this big spike at 8 a.m. doesn't exist on the weekends. It's a weekday thing. Even on the weekends, there's a preference for babies being born during the day. They're less likely to be born in the middle of the night. But, but the difference between day and night is just much, much different on Monday through Friday. And this dark blue line is the sum of all of them. Most babies are born Monday through Friday. In fact, the CDC reports that 78% of them are. So this table is, doesn't look like a distribution. It's kind of two distributions together. So let's break them up. We have a weekday distribution that gives us the hour and the chance, and we have a weekend distribution, which gives us the same hours but different chances. Now we'd like to build what's called a joint distribution. That describes all the outcomes of all the times and days that a baby could be born. It tells us whether it was a weekday or a weekend, and what hour it was born. In order to construct that, I write the following code. The joint table has a day column, an hour column, and a chance. It includes information from all the weekdays. There's a row in the joint table for every outcome in the weekday that includes the same hour that was written in the weekday distribution, the chance from the weekday distribution, that's P of B given A, and then the chance that the baby was born on a weekday in the first place. That's P of A. Likewise, we need a row for every outcome that involves a weekend. So we go through all the weekend rows and we append a new row to birth joint, which says it's on a weekend at a particular hour, the chance P of B given A that the baby was born at that time on the weekend, times the chance of the baby being born on a weekend in general, which is 21.75%. So now we have a table with 48 different outcomes. And from this, we can compute any probability we want that involves both weekdays and weekends and hours. Let's look at babies born at 5 a.m. There are two different outcomes here, the weekday 5 a.m. and the weekend 5 a.m. These are probabilities for outcomes. Together, if we call this uh, the early morning, we can compute the probability in general that the baby is born in the early morning. Now, this joint table is more useful than the original table. Because instead of just saying, what's the probability of a baby being born at 5 a.m., we can also ask, given that I know a baby was born at 5 a.m., what's the chance that it was born on a weekday versus a weekend? So given early morning, if I look at what happens on a weekend, I can ask, what's the probability of that event? which will be 28.6%, which is actually higher than knowing, which is actually quite a bit higher than the chance that a baby was born on a weekend in general, only 21.8%. So what happened there? Well, by learning that the baby was born at 5 a.m. as opposed to another time, we've learned that it's more likely that baby was born on a weekend rather than a weekday. And that's because even though weekends are unlikely in general, um, they have a lot of 5 a.m. babies relative to the number of 5 a.m. Ba babies on a weekday. Now, in that last example, we did something kind of interesting. We had the probability of weekend or weekday. That was A. We had the conditional probability of the hour given the weekday. That was B given A. We also had the conditional probability of the hour given the weekend, another B given A quantity. And what we computed was the probability of A given B. What's the probability that it was on a weekend, given that the hour was 5 AM? So we were able to compute a conditional probability where we had switched the order from the tables that we knew in the first place. And doing that in general uses a formula called Bayes' rule. There's Thomas Bayes. Bayes' rule tells us how to go from probability of A, probability of B, and probability of B given A to compute probability of A given B. 
It's a simple trick of algebra. This is an equation we had before. The definition of the joint probability of a comma b. Now it doesn't matter what I call a and what I call b. So another way of defining the probability of a comma b is by the chance of b occurring times the chance that a occurred given that b occurred. Putting these two equations together gives me the following, which is called Bayes' rule. It says that probability of a given p equals, here we have an expression for the joint probability of a comma b. I've substituted this equation in here. And then I've divided by probability of b, moving this piece over there. And here's where the lecture on Monday ended. So to pick up in the middle of this example, check out the next lecture video.